This is the Gambling Gauchos. Welcome into the Gambling Gauchos. I'm Rob Bro. He's Kyle Jacobson, live from the Cardinals Sports Center studio. You can gear up for high school football coming up. They're at Cardinals, both in Lubbock and Plano. Or on mycardinalsportscenter.com. That's not the web address, but just Google it and you can find it. 26 days till kickoff by the time the folks are listening to this. It is right around the corner. So, Any hints on the who day 26 is? Yes. So we've got two countdown to kickoff tidbits for day 26. Yeah. The first is um, the hint would be that he is a Lubbock restaurateur. Okay. And then the second one is not a player. It's more of a uh, – it's a throwback to 1926. So um, is that the first season? No, that would be the second season. Second season. Oh, 25. That's right. Yeah. Cool. So we got uh, Cujo and the other one. Yeah. Is it Cujo's? Curtis Jordan. You know what? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Cujo's, Teddy Jacks. I'm sorry. That is, that's the person I'm thinking of, but that's not the number. Oh. Um now that you say that, I'm like, no, that's not right. It's Tate Randall. Who? Tate Randall. He's a Lubbock restaurant too? No, I don't think so. I think I got them mixed up. Okay. Um, I don't know that I remember Tate Randall. I'll have to just, the post tomorrow. I'll give our folks a little. I'm sorry. He's 25. We're not even on the right day here. <laughs> I should have pulled this up before just shooting from the hip here. No, no, it's good. So, so 26 is, I think, just one – yeah, just one tidbit for 26 days till kickoff. And then I guess I just spoiled 25 as well. <laughs> and whenever quarter, Curtis Jordan comes up. Yeah. I think I – so Curtis Jordan, I wanted to do him – I couldn't find a picture. So I think he's actually – maybe he was – maybe he was 26, but I couldn't find any evidence of it. So I – Maybe that's what I was thinking of. But anyway, we probably spent too much time on that already. Yeah, well, we do that a lot. But, you know, it's that time of year, a couple weeks till kickoff. You know what other time of year it is right now, Rob? I do. Hatch green chili season. At several places. Several places. And our good friends at Regino Barbecue. I saw on their Instagram, I believe, they're rolling out. So my personal favorite there is the pepper jack jalapeno sausage. And they've got a version of that now with Hatch Creek chilies. I need to try that this month before that uh, is gone. But you all know our friends out at Regino. They're in Olton, Texas. And also all over West Texas now in their mobile food truck. Follow them on social at Regino BBQ, Twitter, Instagram. And they'll let you know where that food truck is stationed every weekend. So... Our friends all across God's country here can go check out the greatest barbecue in the world. They are open until they sell out. So if you want to make sure that they've got your barbecue ready for you, you can order online the night before, rahinobbq.com. But that's on my bucket list for the month of August is to try some of the hatch green chili sausage that they're cooking up out of Rahino. Maybe uh, you'll get to try some September 3rd. I hope so. A little little teaser there for you. And I think we announced this already, but Rahino is going to remain a sponsor of the Gambling Gauchos all throughout football season. So I know a lot of our listeners are based in Dallas, Austin, Houston. Maybe they haven't been out to West Texas since Rahino joined Team Gauchos. So if you are coming into Lubbock for a football game, you know, we get asked all the time, like, hey, I haven't been to Lubbock in five or ten years. What's the best place to eat? That's going to be our recommendation to use it. You try Regina while you're here in the neighborhood. You know, Curtis Jordan also brought uh, five guys to Lubbock. That rings a bell. 
I didn't know that. Yeah, I knew I knew he was involved in more than one. I think he's Teddy Jacks as well. Teddy Jacks. I think at one point he owned the uh, Cabooses. I don't yeah. know if he's still does. We're doing a lot of free ads this episode. Well, it's not an ad. It's just uh, Curtis Jordan, former Texas Tech player. I think there's some value to having your restaurant name thrown out there on the on the gambling gauchos. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big. I'm a. I'm a big. Uh, hey, you'd like uh, Caboose. You've been there in a while. Copper or 50th Street? Uh, uh, Copper's well, gone. I used to go to 50th. Uh, Copper Caboose, I think it's torn down, right? Is it? I thought I saw that. There was some well, demolition I, I in was, that area. I know you love the boneless wings, and they've got some zingers down there. Oh, I do love boneless wings. The zingers. Okay, off topic. Yeah. Not what people are tuning in for. Do you know how hard it is to get a buffalo wing in Lubbock right now? A boneless wing or a like a real wing? To get buffalo sauce on anything. Is that tough? Apparently. I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus because stuff happens. But Friday night, I was going for some boneless wings at a restaurant, and I ordered it with buffalo sauce. Get the order, drive home, open it up. It's barbecue sauce, which is fine. I like barbecue sauce, but it wasn't what I wanted in the moment. So fast forward to Sunday night, I'm still craving buffalo because I haven't had buffalo sauce all weekend call in an order from a different restaurant, pick it up, drive it home. And I go, that buffalo sauce doesn't look quite it was some kind of like Asian zing or hot honey type. It still wasn't buffalo sauce. So I'm like, well, somebody, when I order buffalo sauce on my boneless wings or tenders or saucy nugs, or whatever the hell you want to call them, I don't care. <laughs> uh, I just want buffalo sauce on them. And it, it, it's hard to come by this weekend, apparently. Interesting. I didn't know. Is there like a shortage or just uh, incompetent? Uh, I think they just got my order wrong both times, yeah. but but two different restaurants. So two different two different restaurants, uh, same restaurant, different places, or two different restaurants. Period. No, two different restaurants. Oh man, wow, that's well. You dropped one of the sauce flavors, so we know one of them was um, a wild experience. But I, I don't know uh, the other one. Well, no, so it wasn't it wasn't, it wasn't Asian Zing one. trademark. It was just something like that. It wasn't oh. Buffalo Wild Wings. But I'm not going to say who it was because I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. No, no. Why would you? Not my style, Rob. No, no. Uh, we're not in the business of hurting people. <laughs> Unless you come after our baseball coach. What a <laughs> clown. What a freaking ass clown that guy is. I, is it, I mean, just to put something out there that, A, you really don't know anything about, uh, and B, like probably just heard from somebody's mom. Right. You know what I mean? Like some kid got cut and the family's upset, right? Understandably. But if you're going to get cut for a baseball season, wouldn't you rather be cut in August than January? Yes. And this is also not a Tim Tadlock problem. It's a timeline of college baseball and major league baseball problem. Yes. Makes no sense to have the transfer portal deadline two months before the MLB draft when all these rosters are bound to turn over again. I think and these guys it makes sense to have the major league baseball draft in the middle of the summer when a lot of these recruiting classes are affected by the that. You know what? As as loose as they've gotten with the transfer rules, have the draft whenever you want. And I say through December 31st, because baseball is a spring sport, December 31st transfer, no penalty, no waiver needed. That way everybody can report for fall camp and then you whittle down the roster to whatever size it needs to be for the spring. And every single kid gets to land on his feet somewhere else. No waiver, doesn't have to sit out, any of that. Just do that. But NCAA won't do it, so they're going to keep making these kids enter their name into the transfer portal before the MLB draft. When a program like Tech is going to have 12 guys taken, maybe yeah. nine of them will leave, maybe four of them will leave. And so there's bound to be roster churn and turnover. And, yes, you over-recruit your roster every year it's a natural part of being a successful baseball team and you recruit 25 guys when you don't have 25 spaces because you don't know what's going to happen in the draft. Mm -hmm. Like you have to do that. Well, and even after the draft. So like uh, Cole Stillwell wasn't drafted and he left anyway and and good for him. I'm not blaming him, but like there's so much volatility with baseball rosters over the summer. There's no coach, no program in the country unless they've just got a million spots open that, that just has it down pat, you know, when the summer is over. No. So I, I thought that was a cheap shot. 
and that guy is an ass clown. But well, and it's funny it got so much whatever. play because you look at who's playing it, and it's Vanderbilt fans and uh, Rice fans and like programs that either also do the same things or have personal beef with Texas Tech because they hammer them every year. Yeah. So it was just funny. Yeah, it's um, it's envy, I think. Well, the the Rice uh, coach and Tim Tadlock almost got in a fight the last time they played. Do you remember that? Yes, and that same Rice fan, the only Rice fan I've ever encountered on Twitter, is yeah. the same one chirping in our mentions today as who was chirping at Chris Sneed and some other guys back in February when that series was played. Funny. That guy's a former player. I'll call him a has-been. I'm a never was, so that's you know not really a shot at him. Yeah, I don't know about that. But he's chirping on Twitter weird. 20 years after his playing career, just peddling lies about Tim Tadlock because they've been surpassed in state by a program they probably didn't want to be surpassed by. But that's the world we're living in. And it was it was cool to see former players come to his defense. I mean, this is uh, small, but like Patrick Monteverdi quote tweeted it and called it out. Um, a starting pitcher from the team this past season liked our response to it, which was not really – we didn't really hold any punches, I didn't think. So that guy, I think, runs some kind of website and probably wanted some clicks. And like you're saying, his source was probably the people who were most sensitive and most hurt by this decision and not really people analyzing it as objectively with fewer emotions involved. So it is what it is. It's also really funny because you you scroll down that guy's page – and he's, you know, oh, we got to think of the kids. We got to – this is not good for the student athletes. And then three tweets later, it's, we really got to get this NIL under handle, man. These kids should not be making this money. It's like, okay, do you, do you want – are you pro-kid or not? Are you pro-student athlete or not? Because NIL is pro-student athlete. I also – this, this is the last thing I'll say. I thought it was hilarious that he used Tadlock's headshot just like a zoomed in picture of his face. Yeah. Almost like he's trying to make the tweet look like a mug shot. Like this coach right here, cut a player on August 2nd. That's like, yeah, come on. Anyway, it's almost football season. So we'll save the baseball chatter for a little bit later on. Baseball is a talking sport. You know that. Yeah. Um, let's continue with part two of the series you introduced Last episode, what will it take for every team to win the Big 12 football this year? We did the bottom four teams with the longest odds, according to Vegas, to win the conference championship last episode. Uh, we did Kansas, West Virginia, Texas Tech, and Kansas State, correct? And the next three longest odds, you've got them in front of you, so I'll let you. Yes, yeah, so the next one is Iowa State at just under 1,600. Then TCU at just under fifteen hundred, and then there's a pretty big gap to Oklahoma State, who is plus six hundred. So you want to start with Iowa State? Yeah. Let me preface this by saying, I'm not I'm not buying Iowa State stock this year. They lost so much, and I think highly of Matt Campbell. I ranked him as the second best coach in the Big Twelve this summer, and I guess on one hand. That is still to their advantage because there's some other programs breaking in new head coaches that are either new to that program or new to being a head coach entirely that maybe they can remain kind of a, a notch or two above those programs. But it's just hard for me to see unless they've just turned into the kind of program that can recruit consistently well and reload when a guy like Brock Purdy, Chase Allen, Charlie Kolar, Brees Hall leave then I don't see a path, but that I think that's what it would look like is, is if you just kind of like at the end of the season could put on a – or do like a blind side-by-side -side test. Last year's Iowa State guys, this year's Iowa State guys. And, you know, the names and numbers on the jerseys changed, but the production was the same. Because they've been, you know, in November the past two or three seasons, they've been in the fight to go to Irving. So uh, Irving? Arlington? Arlington. Arlington. Irving is where the Big 12 headquarters is. We've been talking too much yeah. expansion. Um, they've been in the picture in November to get to Arlington. And so I think they're another one of those teams that uh, needs to hope that the parity that we perceive there to be in the league is actually there and that it, the second place team can get in there at six and three on some tiebreakers. I think that's sort of the scenario that it would take for Iowa State to get there. 
Yeah, and if you're it, you're you're replacing, like you said, a bunch of people on offense, quarterback, you go from Brock Purdy to a kid named Hunter Deckers, um, sophomore, not played a lot because Brock Purdy was always healthy pretty much. Uh, and then Brees Hall leaves. You have Jarrell Brock now. Um, now, uh, Iowa State's kind of been running back you for the last couple of years. They have. Uh, the best kind of boom, boom, boom with running backs. So you would assume they'll be okay there. Uh, they also have, you know, stepped up as far as the offensive line goes. I thought their offensive line was better last year. Um, but defensively, you're also missing Mike Rose, Jake Hummel, uh, Greg Eisworth. So you almost have to replace just as much on defense as you're replacing on offense. Um, but I'll tell you what. If Will McDonald – does what he does in the pass rush. And um, I think his name is Vaughn, who's a huge linebacker. And then they kind of replace a couple of safeties. The defense could remain. The yep. defense is scheme over talent, right? I, I so will say, I for, think for Iowa State to win, and they have to nail the quarterback, nail the running back replacement and nail all three levels of the defense replacements that they're having to do. I think they also might have one of the top three wideouts in the Big 12. Xavier Hutchison, I think, is his name. Is that right? Sounds right. I might have botched his name. Um, he had a pretty good game against Tech last season, it seemed. But you've got him. I do worry for the sake of Cyclone fans that – their defense might be getting a little bit stale. It was it was pretty innovative, and it was tough to beat for a lot of teams when they first introduced it. Now, I think a lot of teams are actually emulating it. It's kind of like when Texas Tech was – they were still good at running the air raid, but once everybody else was running spread up-tempo offenses, it sort of minimized that as a strategic advantage. Right. So I would need to see maybe like a new wrinkle or – an altered identity on defense. I don't know if they can just run the same thing they've run the past three or four years and be as successful at it scheme-wise on defense, if that makes sense. Fair enough. All right, let's go to TCU. Hey, hey TCU. real quick. Yeah? Um, what are Iowa State's odds to win the Big 12, and what are Texas Tech's? Iowa State is plus 1,576, and Texas Tech's 4,236. Okay. So roughly two and a half times longer odds for Texas Tech to win the whole mm -hmm. thing. I don't know if this is how a, a book would do this, but if I gave you plus 250 that Texas Tech would finish higher, because that's two and a half units, plus 250 that Texas Tech would finish higher in the Big 12 standings than Iowa State, would you take that? I would consider it, yes. Or maybe it probably wouldn't be that high. It'd probably be minus 250 on Iowa State to finish higher than something like plus 200 yeah. for Texas Tech to finish higher. Look, I'm I high think I Texas would. Tech, but until I see it, right? I, I mean, we'll get to TCU in a second here, but there are three teams I see continuously picked above us that, especially if you gave me plus money odds, Iowa State, TCU, West Virginia, I would pick Tech to finish higher than each of those teams. And if two out of three or one out of three caches. If you've got long enough odds and you're plus money on those, on that trio of bets. That's, that's how bullish I am right now on Texas tech and how skeptical I am of Iowa state and TCU. So I guess we can get into TCU now. I guess they're the next shortest odds to win it. Yeah. I would say just has such safe game planning. It's like, they don't seem like boom or bust to me. Are they together this year? Is that, is the, team together well they were the most together team they'd ever had last year and went right. you, so. you just wonder if they've maintained that togetherness we'll see no that's how they can win the big 12 is they just get a little more together well the greatest team in iowa state history lost to an uber each driver last season so it's true i've heard that that was one of the so, best twitter inboxes that i've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> tcu sunny dykes first year 
Um, five and seven last year, three and six in the conference. They're trying to bounce back after firing their best coach in school history. The guy after the guy is generally not the guy. Uh, you also have Max Duggan, who's been the guy for two or three years, it seems like, who all of a sudden is not the guy anymore. Uh, may not even start the season as the starting quarterback with Chandler Morris. Um, how does TCU put this together? Because I'm struggling to even come up with a good plan for them. Yeah, this, it, it was easier to make a case for West Virginia, honestly. And West Virginia had the eighth best odds. TCU, I guess, is the fifth best odds. So that that's a little bit that again, that's where I'm I'm selling all the TCU stock I can this season. Yes. Um I guess what would have to happen is they just have to lean into the strong home field advantage and you know make sure that they go four and oh in conference play at home. Yeah. It, maybe maybe if they can split their road games, then uh, no, obviously they have no home field advantage, but yeah, you, you'd have to see some kind of like revival of Max Duggan because he has flashed a lot. I don't know if he's consistently accurate, but he can make a ton of plays with his feet. He's ex more experienced than a lot of the guys that are going to be starting quarterbacks in the Big 12 this year. And maybe a new offensive coordinator is exactly what he needs. You know, Garrett Riley and Sonny Dyke got a ton of a ton of success at SMU, which is, of course, a different level of football. But, you know, if they're able to just kind of make that translate and just do what they did in the American Athletic, move it over to the Big 12, I, I guess I could see them – being pretty competitive. I don't, I'm not predicting that. I think they're going to struggle more than they succeed this year. But I think if we're looking back and TCU's playing for a Big 12 title against Texas or OU or whoever, um, I think we'll look back and say, man, Garrett Riley did a great job with Max Duggan, got them back to being a really formidable offense, and they won six or seven conference games. I think for them to win the Big 12, Chandler Morris has to win the job because he's the arm. Um, yeah. Okay. Duggan's the legs. Morris is the arm. Uh, they also do have a favorable home schedule. Um, as far as they have five home games in the Big 12 play and four road games. So if they do go undefeated at home, that's Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Kansas State, Texas Tech, and Iowa State. And then you're flipping coins. You, you think they can beat Kansas on the road. West Virginia on the road does not seem too daunting. Uh, and then you just have to be either Texas or Baylor on the road. Uh, and you're finishing conference play up with one loss. So if they can beat Oklahoma and Oklahoma State and Kansas State at home, which I think are their three toughest, uh, besides maybe a Texas Tech, who the atmosphere in that game is not going to be conducive to TCU winning, um, even at home. So – I mean, the schedule lends itself. Uh, I think Garrett Riley and Chandler Morris are a pretty good match coaching and quarterback wise, but I just, I don't know if they have the athletes that they've had in the past. Uh, Quentin Johnson, big six, four wide receiver. Um, but then the rest of it's like. I mean, th they lost the greatest running back in school history to the transfer right. portal this off season. Yeah. Zach Evans, you know. And then I guess the rest of their kind of stars you're picking out are defensive backs, but I'm curious who there and and do they run the and uh, a defense as good as Gary Patterson's? Right. Yeah. No, I'm still hung up on that piece, especially like the guy who goes after Dan Mullen at Mississippi State, Bill Snyder at Kansas State. You know, any job like that, you never want to follow the greatest coach in school history at a program, especially a program that doesn't just naturally reload every year. Like, Yeah, how is Tommy like, Tuberville considered? Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, I am curious, though, on something you said. You think it needs to be Chandler Morris. Yeah. I would push back on that in this respect. The recipe at SMU, and maybe it'll change now that they're coaching in the Big 12, but Sonny Dykes and Garrett Riley excelled at taking Power 5 transfers with experience who moved down a level. And part of why they were successful on offense was because they had Shane Bouchelle, the guy who played a, played a ton of snaps at Texas, had played several spring uh, practices. And then it was Tanner Mordecai, who didn't get a ton of run at OU. But, again, you're in that program for a few off seasons. You're absorbing stuff from a guy like Lincoln Riley. You know a lot going in. I would think 
at least on the surface, that they'd be more successful with the more experienced guy in Doug. But maybe maybe they're treating this more like a rebuild year and they get Chandler Morris and then next year they lean into that experience. But as far as for the scenario we're talking about, if they were to win the Big 12, what would that look like? I think based on their past track record, it would need to be the quarterback with more experience. Yeah. I mean, your logic is sound. Certainly. Um, and Duggan, you know, I'm, I'm looking at their stats, crossing them out, but I, I don't know. I, Duggan, 63% completion, 2,000 yards, 16 touchdowns, six interceptions last year. Morris, 66% completion, 700 yards in a third of the attempts. So the, are they the same guy pretty much from what you can tell? No, I think Chandler Morris has a better arm. Okay. Duggan, it surprises me that Duggan was up to 64%. He was yeah. a 53% passer his freshman year. Yeah, he was a runner. 61% pass for last year. And then it was surprising to me that he was 64% last year. I did not expect that. Yeah. Um, Chandler Morris did not throw an interception last year. And I believe started the game when they beat Baylor. Okay. If I'm not mistaken. You know what's what's interesting about that Baylor-TCU game last year? What? Baylor was clearly the better team. Yes. And lost. I think this is public knowledge by now, but that was the week that uh, Joey McGuire first started talking to Texas Tech about the job. And so I, I'm ready to troll Baylor fans that, like, Joey lost his focus. He's the real leader of the team, not Dave Aranda. Yeah. And so when he had his mind somewhere else, they lost to just a horrible TCU team last season. TCU's only big 12 wins last year. Kansas, they beat us down in Lubbock. Yep. And that Baylor upset, which they had no business winning. I mean, Chandler Morris was 29 of 41, 70% passing, 461 yards and two touchdowns, 70 yards rushing and another touchdown. Interesting. Yeah. I'm, I don't see it. I, I think I laid out what that would look like if they were to play for a Big 12 title, but I'm, yeah. I'm not taking it. Yeah, I don't see it either. All right, Oklahoma State, who the shortest odds we've seen so far, plus 624, and I would say the first legitimate contender. Um, and what they need to do this year is exactly what they did last year, except be better for one more play. Yeah, they need one more yard. Um, the problem is – One more inch. The problem is they had one of the best defenses in the country last year. Yep. And the architect of that defense is gone which is not to say that they can't be great on defense again this year, but they're going to have to prove it without, you know, that guy leading the charge, Jim Knowles, who left for Ohio State. Um, is it fair to say that going into year – going into year uh, four of Spencer Sanders that he is what he is at this point? Yeah, I think okay. that's very fair. And, that's been fair. And that ceiling is not – horribly tall is it no and i think the the these when players come in to the big 12 right especially quarterbacks you at least see their floor go up but it still seems like spencer sanders floor is exactly where it was and his ceiling is exactly where it was and he's just been the same for four years let's uh let's talk real quick not um not where you predict these quarterbacks will be, but higher ceiling, JT Daniels, right? Would you say JT Daniels has a higher ceiling than Spencer Sanders? Oh, we going one on one? Yeah. Uh, no, I would say Spencer Sanders has a uh, higher ceiling. See, I think it's JT Daniels, but that's okay. We don't. Have, I'm just kind of lightning rounding this. Yeah. Uh, Blake Shapin. I would say Shapin has a, a higher ceiling. Me too. Uh, whoever emerges from Texas Tech's quarterback room, higher ceiling than Spencer Sanders? Uh, Donovan, yes. Barron, yes. Okay. Um, Adrian Martinez? Again, not not the no. worst of Adrian Martinez. Okay. No, 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 no. no. Um, let's see here. Who else? Who am I missing here? You got Jason um, Bean. No, I'm not going to go that far. Um, 
How about Dylan Gabriel or Quinn Ewers? Certainly they have a higher ceiling than Spencer Sanders. Yeah. So you see what I'm getting at. Now, all those guys are not going to play up to their ceiling, but I think it's easy to live in a world where Spencer Sanders finishes the season like maybe honorable mention all Big 12. He's the fourth He's the fourth best quarterback in the Big 12, maybe. Right. And so that is a problem Bad for Spencer me. Sanders. That's a problem for me combined with their defensive coordinator departing. So I'm I'm more bearish on Oklahoma State than some are. I think a lot of people, like you said, they're like, oh, well, they were in the game last year. They got the same head coach, same quarterback. Maybe they got a shot to go back. I think if if it does turn out that way, I think that – I think Baylor is probably not as good as some are expecting, and that carves out a clear kind of – third slot behind Texas and OU. Uh, and then Oklahoma State would have to handle – they would have to win one of those two games, Texas or Oklahoma, and uh, hope that, you know, they can scratch and claw to a 7-2 and two type finish and be that second team that makes it to Arlington. Yeah. Because I don't – I just can't tell you realistically that Spencer Sanders is going to make a great leap forward and be first team all Big 12, even though he is preseason first team all Big 12. I think there's no way he finishes there. Well, and, I think there is a way because if if they win the Big 12, he will be the – I mean, that's just how it works. I think if you're looking at Spencer Sanders and he finishes there and they win the Big 12, it's because he, he had some ball control this year that he did not have in the previous years. Like he throws That's six fair. interceptions instead of 12. I'm just saying I'd, I'd typically, in almost any other scenario, be higher on the idea of the preseason guy staying there through the end of the year. Preseason yeah. first team all big He's 12 never, finishing that I way. Mean, but Most touchdowns in a season. Most touchdowns in a season for Spencer Sanders. Do you know what it is? 30? I'll give you, I'll give you rushing and passing together. Okay, he has run for uh, 35. 26. Wow. He's never thrown for more than 20 touchdowns in a year. Wow. And that was last year. But he also rushed for six last year and had yeah. 700 yards rushing. So he was responsible for 3,500 yards last year and 26 touchdowns, but he also threw 12 interceptions. And I'm sure fumbled too because he fumbled 17 times as a freshman or whatever. Yeah. I think he has gotten better in that respect, but yeah, I just combining those two factors, Spencer Sanders and his obvious ceiling combined with Jim Knowles departing for Ohio State, it's hard for me to see them returning. But if they are, it's going to be because Baylor isn't as good, yeah, and they beat Texas or OU, and, and maybe one of those two teams is, you know, obviously Steve Sarkeesian wasn't great in year one. Brent Venables hasn't proven anything as a head coach, so maybe one of those top two. Spots to take in Oklahoma State is just – I think they're a really high floor team. I don't. It would be hard for me to see them falling below like five wins in Big 12 play. I just don't know if I can see them getting up to eight wins in Big 12 play. I think you could also argue it's not going to be the offense at all that is going to lead them to the Big 12 championship. It's going to be the defense. You could also argue that four of their top five players are defensive linemen. And like pass rushers and not just defensive tackles. I mean, Trace Ford, who was out last year, is back. Uh, and he was really good the year before. And then you have Oliver and Martin, who both had double digit sacks last year. Uh, and then Lacey, who had eight and a half sacks. It, I mean, it's just eight and a half in his career, but still, I, I think you need some offensive players to step up. I don't I don't know that they have just a bunch of offensive depth. I think running back is going to be a big problem for them because just like Iowa State, you're replacing a bunch of pretty good ones. So we'll see. But if Spencer Sanders cuts his turnovers and the defense is as good as last year, they'll be back in the Big 12 championship picture. Give me their Big 12 odds again. Uh, it was six twenty-eight. So they're plus six hundred. Let's call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, plus six hundred. I would rather take a flyer on Kansas State and West Virginia 
than put a unit or two down on Oklahoma State. I uh, I would believer. rather f- – yeah, with Kansas State, yes. I would not be there with West Virginia. Okay. Similar conversation that I want to pivot to. I had this idea, I guess, a yeah. couple of weeks ago when an article was written – this was about the time that Texas Tech announced the facilities upgrades in the south end zone, the Matador Club NIL program, and I'm legitimately blanking on who the blogger or columnist was, but they wrote – they actually just asked the question. They didn't even make the assertion. They asked aloud in a column, could Texas Tech be positioning itself to be at the top of the new Big 12? And this is something you and I have talked about that is exciting about the new Big 12 is there's yes. going to be a competitive balance. There's not going to be two programs at the top with insane uh, disparity in resources and other advantages. And so, yeah, it's open for a BYU, Oklahoma State, Baylor, Cincinnati to kind of take the top spot. And I'm, you know, looking at this through rose-colored glasses or scarlet and black-colored glasses, as it were. And I think Texas Tech does have potential to move to the top of the new Big 12. 100%. The reaction to that article was not so great. A lot of people laughed at it. Um, I get frustrated at that because I think that a lot of people are judging programs like Texas Tech, TCU, Oklahoma State, and Baylor as a snapshot of today coming off of their greatest decade in program history or in Texas Tech's case, their worst decade in program history. Yeah. And acting like that's just going to be linear in a straight line for the next 10 or 20 years when that's obviously not the case. We know this goes up and down. So I had the idea, you know, I started conversing with people on Twitter and it was like, well, you know, I'm higher on Texas Tech's odds five years from now than I am TCU's and just got me wondering, okay, in the new big 12, let's take stock of where every big 12 program is today. Kind of like their five year average up till today. And do we want to, buy stock in that program, which means we think they're going to ascend in the new Big 12? Do we want to hold stock in that program, think that they'll be about the same as where they are now? Or do we want to sell stock in that program, assuming that they're going to decline a little bit in the new Big 12 over the next five years? So let's just, let's go geographically and start in the state of Texas. Okay. Let's go with Baylor. I think they'll be the furthest, the team further south in the new Big 12. Well, Houston. Um, but let's do the the hateful eight first, and then talk other programs. But yeah, let's start with Baylor. What do you think about them? Buy, hold, or sell? I would hold Baylor. I agree. I think they are about at their ceiling, but I think Dave Aranda, with his contract extension, um, and with the opportunities they'll have. Uh, they'll be right where they are, and they'll be competing for Big 12 championships in five years from now. Baylor is is one of the tougher ones for me to take stock of right now because Dave Aranda has been there two years. One of those, they went like three and seven, and then the other, they went they won 12 games, a Big 12 championship, and a Sugar Bowl. In the two years prior to that, or three years prior to that, Matt Rule built them up from one and 11 to six and six to – playing for a Big 12 title and um, a New Year's Six Bowl. So looking at their last five years, it's like, are are they the team? Are they the New Year's Six team? Are they 500? Are they below 500? Because they've had seasons that fit all three of those categories. I would go with hold. I I wouldn't want to sell because I think they are in a a good position. Um, But it'd be hard for me to buy because, like you said, I don't see them. Like the only way they could go up is if they started to win the Big 12 extremely consistently and maybe contend for a playoff berth. I don't know if I'm willing to go that far. And if Aranda leaves, are they going to, are they going to hit on the next coaching hire? So I'm with you. I'd, I'd hold. I mean, they're three for three on coaching hires in the last three. Well, I know I don't know what you want with Art Browse, but on, still on the field. On. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, okay. TCU. Um, I'll lead this one off and I alluded to this earlier, I'm selling any program that is replacing its greatest coach in school history. And it starts and ends there for me. Yeah. And I, I like Sonny Dykes, but just where they are and kind of 
some similarities, I think, to Texas Tech's history. I, I would say they are in, in a position to go down for a couple of years. So I would sell TCU, yeah. I think so, too. I think they're already competing with Baylor, who has more momentum as a program. I think Texas Tech has more momentum as a program. And I think a lot of kids in DFW would rather go somewhere else. I think in if, the current state of affairs. Yeah. If anybody was most hurt by Houston coming in, I think it's TCU. I think you might be right. You know, honestly, uh, I don't think tech recruits down there as much as people think. There are kids from Houston on the roster, but if you take 20 kids in a high school class, four of them might be from the Houston area. Yeah. I'm totally you guessing at that number. Way but, more than the DFW. Yeah. Uh, even more like in the Austin Metro lately, like Taj Brooks from uh, Mainer. So um, we'll circle back to Texas Tech at the end. So let's move our way up to Oklahoma State. What do you think? Buy, sell, or hold? Uh, I mean, they've been holding for 10 years. Yeah. So I guess I would – Hold on. Eventually, Gundy will leave. Um, but if he hasn't left yet, why would he leave now, I guess? So I, I would hold on Oklahoma State cautiously. I'm uh, I'm actually selling Oklahoma State. I I think Gundy has had a – he's been there, what, this will be year 16? Uh, a lot of guys just don't stay that long. And yeah. I know he's had opportunities to leave. He's There's been friction with the athletic department, and he's not gone anywhere. But at some point, for one reason or another, this is going to end, whether he just gets sick of it, takes a different job, or they fire him after a couple bad seasons. I don't think they should fire him. No. But, well, there's um, Patterson. Him. Right, or Mac Brownin. I think, like you said, 2011, um, they won a New Year's Six Bowl or BCS Bowl at the time. Ten years later, they do the same thing. It it's hard to maintain that level of success for for even a decade as long as they have. And they had some ten and eleven win seasons with Mason Rudolph in between. I I think similar to Baylor, they've been at their ceiling for almost fifteen years, and I just don't see that happening, continuing to happen into the future. And so, I'm not like down on them. I still think they'll be a solid program, but. Somebody's going to have to follow Mike Gundy, and I just got through saying that it's hard to replace your greatest coach in school history, and they're going to have to do that soon, I think, one way or another. So I'm selling for that reason. They've got great facilities. They've got great fan support. They've got the recent success, but I'm, I'm selling despite all that. Let's make our way up to the Sunflower State, Kansas and K-State. Uh, let's start with Kansas. Lance Leipold heading into year two. Kind of nowhere to go but up. So this is either a buy or a hold. You can't really sell stock in Kansas right now. <laughs> can, I, can I buy Kansas to just improve marginally, or would that be a hold? I think that's okay because if even if they get to the point where they're three and six every year in the Big Twelve, that's their stock has gone up. So I, I think yeah. that's okay. I'm buying Kansas. I'd probably trail you on that pick. Buy low. Th this is a really low risk because again, they can't go down. Uh, they could. They could go winless for five years in a row. I guess that'd be yeah. – but they can't go down much. You know, They've been 1-11 and 11 and 2-10 and 10 a lot over the last decade. So, I mean, all you have to do is win two Big 12 games to double your profit. Yeah. Because they've yeah. not done that. I, I'm, I'm buying, though. I think Lance Leipold – I think he showed a lot, at least in my eyes, in year one. Now, it's a long – it's a hard road to hoe there at Kansas, and it's going to take time. It's a long journey to get to where they want to be. But um, I could see them getting to a point where they're more competitive in their losses and are in a position to win two or three Big 12 games a year. I think he can build that there. Uh, a lot of people are kind of high on them this season. They think that Kansas might win two or three Big 12 games this year. So uh, I, I would buy. I'm not expecting a huge return on that. But like I said, you can't sell it. So, And I, I think – if I picked hold, that would be not quite reflective of how I view Lance Leipold and the job he's done in a little over a year there. So uh, Kansas State, this one's a little more interesting. They had Bill Snyder in his first tenure. 
got them from the doormat of the Power Five to nearly the pinnacle. Uh, they won 11 games six times in seven years under Bill Snyder the first time. And then Ron Prince was tasked with following the greatest coach in school history and wet the bed. Bill Snyder came back, found pretty good success, not quite the same as his first tenure. And now Chris Kleiman is also following the greatest coach in school history. <laughs> um, I'm going been... to fight back on that one. Okay. Bill Snyder 1.0 was the greatest coach in, in Kansas State history, but Kleiman gets to follow Bill Snyder 2.0. That's fair. That's fair. Same so guy, I, but yeah, different expectations, I think. Yeah. And so I, I don't I don't think Kleiman has the same exact pressure. Like it's not Gary Patterson coming off the big run. It's not when Gundy gets replaced. It's not Tuberville coming in for Leach. Because Kansas State was good in the last decade, uh, but they weren't the 90s Kansas State. Right. They've been a little bit up and down, but I think without pulling up their season records, I think they're mostly a seven and eight win team yeah. over the last five years. I would I would hold. I think that they'll be still in that realm. I think highly of Kleiman. I think he could certainly win nine, even ten games in a season with them. I don't see them doing that consistently, though. And so I think they'll be a competitive team. I think they could be in the upper half of the new Big 12, but I'm holding for now. Because they also they have a, a lower floor than some other programs in the new Big 12. Uh, I think we alluded to this a couple episodes ago. Bill Snyder certainly raised their floor, and the facilities upgrades there have raised their floor. But even with that improvement, I think their floor is lower than some other programs. So I'm holding K-State over kind of what, what I perceive their stock to be over the last five years or so. I think Kansas State will play for a Big 12 championship in the next five years, so I would buy. Okay. I like it. Um, Iowa State, Matt Campbell is heading into year seven. Started in 2016. This will be year seven. Um, honestly, there's kind of, I think, a good amount of disagreement as to what their stock is right now. If you ask some people, like me, I would tell you that Matt Campbell's done a great job there. And uh, other people would say, uh, you know, July 5th, 7-5 is Matt Campbell Day. and He's never won 10 games, and their one good season was a COVID year. and They underwhelmed the year that they were preseason top 10 and Big 12 title contenders. I, I do see both sides of that. I think if you looked longer term at 20 years, 50 years, what that program is, there's no denying that Matt Campbell has elevated the program. I, having said all that, I'm going to sell – I think the last two years were kind of Matt Campbell's peak at Iowa State. Would love to be proven wrong because I'm a fan of his and a fan of that fan base. But if I had to choose today, I would probably sell on the basis that historically they've never sustained success like this before. And he's still a young guy who could finally decide to bounce. I know he's turned down jobs before, but he could finally say, you know what, I've had enough of uh, my time here in Ames, I'm going to go to the NFL or I'm going to go to a different Power 5 job. So for those reasons, I'm selling. Also selling. Similar reasons. I just – people talk about them like they've won 10 games four times in the last five years. And they haven't. They're a 7-5 and five program. Can I push back a little bit on that? I, I mean, go for it, but I know what you're going to say, and I, I don't disagree with you. Can I guess? Say, yeah, guess. That their 7-5 and five and 8-4 and four is better because they lived on 3-9 and nine for 20 years. That was going to be one of my reasons. And it's not just that they hit 7-5, and 8-4. and four, It's that they've done it five seasons in a row, which I think last time I looked, Iowa State's not had five consecutive winning seasons since the 1920s. So, you, so are you holding or selling? I'm selling. I think uh, the other thing I was going to say, people bring up that 10-win stat all the time, and it's even like a meme in Iowa State circles. Part of that is a little bit skewed because in 2020, they won nine games, and their season was cut short by two games because of COVID. They would have played probably an FCS opponent and gotten their 10th win. So like, if not for a global pandemic, they would have at least one 10-win season under their belt. It's kind of like a technicality. It's like, you know, okay, People bring up that South Tech as well. Oh, they've only won 10 games six times in their history. Okay, but they went like nine and one back when 
they used to play 10 games instead of 12, 13, 14 with a conference right. championship game. So it's a little bit, would you rather go nine and one in the fifties or 10 and four in 2021? But even then, well, if you're going 10 and four, you're playing a big 12 title game and a bowl game. So yeah. So I'd rather go 10 and four, but, but your win percentage well, is I, I, was, I was just throwing out an arbitrary number, 10 wins. Like, they, they act like they've done more than they have in the past five years. And I don't think – even if they double up, because what you're saying is that's the rate of diminishing returns, right? Because if they go 7-5 and five the first five years, that's incredible. They've never done it before. But if you go 7-5 and five the next five years, well, yeah, that's what you did the last five years. You're not improving at all. So I would sell. Yeah, we agree. We're, we're saying we the same thing, yeah. We don't agree on, I guess, where they're at today, but I guess we're both selling anyway. Let's move over to West Virginia. Sort of the yeah, they're uh, about to get a new head coach. I don't see Neil Brown lasting two more seasons. Um, if Graham Harrell takes over, I'll buy. Um, I don't think he will because you're not going to hire a coach that you just fired the staff from. So, uh, sell. So, I'm buying. and I what? I'm buying. I think West Virginia is in the worst spot because now you have two East Coast teams, and I think UCF and Cincinnati both have a better opportunity than West Virginia. I think West Virginia is a lot like Texas Tech. People forget about what they did in the 2000s, and even that they they sustained success even longer. They won an Orange Bowl in 2011, right before their move to the Big 12. I think they've underachieved as a program over the last decade versus what they think their expectations are. They've got fan support. They should have home field advantage. Um, They recruit in areas that most of the Big 12 does not necessarily directly compete in. I I see them actually going up. I I view them very similarly to Texas Tech, honestly. And we'll get to them. And I'm going to buy stock in Texas Tech in case anybody couldn't tell. But I'm buying stock in West Virginia. Yeah, I, I guess if your if your opinion is getting teams closer to them improves their recruiting, um, fine. But they had like twenty five guys transfer out, and people say that's not a big deal. But it, it just I don't understand the West Virginia fan base loving head coach Neil Brown. I don't think they do. They talk think, like they do. I think they – And he's got a top 25 recruiting class, so they're loving something. I think they either think they do or they're trying to convince themselves that they do. They have Stockholm Syndrome. They need to let him go. Did you ever have a girlfriend in high school that, like, you didn't actually like, but you wanted to have a girlfriend? And so you're like, oh, yeah, she's great. Yeah, but I wasn't uh... – okay. All right. I, don't know, I, I think it's a similar phenomenon. I think they're like, yeah, Coach Brown. It's like the guys that kind of sucked under him. Like, I don't – think they have any reason to like him i think they're just like hardcore homers which i can respect yeah and they want to support him but i i think like if you hook them up to a lie detector test they would not say i don't think they would pass that but have they done anything in like facilities or anything else because i also am selling their basketball program i think bob huggins is toast um like i would sell the west virginia athletic department right now I just don't think they're in a good spot. We might just agree to disagree. Okay. Basketball has finished last in the Big 12 two out of the last three years. So I, I hear you there. Maybe that'd be a better hold if they're already kind of considered. But historically, again, it's kind of like how far back do you want to go as far as taking stock of these teams. But um, That's also like Big East success. Yeah, that's fair. It's like TCU success all came when they were in the Mountain West. They dominated the Mountain West. Well, this isn't the Mountain West. It's true. West Virginia also, they would tell you that in 2016 and in 2018, if the two teams leaving Texas and OU were already gone, that they would have been the favorite to win the Big 12, and they're they're probably right. So they would point to that and say, in the new Big 12, we're going to be that program that wins 10 games and competes for Big 12 titles. They also pushed out a good head coach because he was crazy. So I think they want to win. Excuse me? I don't think they want to win. 
before that, they pushed out a coach because they're crazy? Because he's crazy. They pushed out Dan Holgerson because he's crazy. Yeah, you know, a program like West Virginia needs somebody a little bit more clean cut and buttoned up than Dana Holgerson, right? What? No, I, I'm with you. That this kind of like yeah. I get it. If you're Baylor, you know right. you want you, like Baylor and Dana Holgers is not a good fit. I would thought West yeah. Virginia was perfect for Dana. Yeah. Um. So that covers the hateful eight. Sands, Texas Tech. Do you want to get into the newcomers? And then Texas. Yeah, I mean, Tech? I think it's going to be pretty obvious. Obvious what we're saying about uh, Texas Tech. So we can do the others first. UCF. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm buying UCF. I've been buying UCF for the last five years, even before they were joining. I think they've been hungry to grow. I think they're exploding as a university. Um, the bounce house is just a different place than it was 10 years ago. Um, I think they will be very, very eager to even add more developments when they start getting some Big 12 money. So, uh, yeah, I'm buying UCF especially because they've had a couple of down years. I think they'll bounce back. Now, it's interesting when you talk about these programs jumping into the Big 12 because there's a curve there. Um, Because UCF could be really bad for two years and then explode. Um, But I I would buy UCF stock with the the curve. I'm buying UCF. For a couple reasons. One, they are on their way to having the largest student body. And over time, that'll turn into the largest alumni base in the entire Power Five. I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know if that means brand power or a ton of money on streaming, you know, whatever that model looks like in 10 or 15 years. The other reason I'm buying. They're in a extremely recruiting rich territory and you can do a lot of good for yourself picking up the kids that didn't quite make it for Florida state and Alabama and Georgia. Another reason I'm buying there has not ever been a program that has ascended as quickly as UCF. They were, they were FCS in the late nineties. Yeah. Um, in less than a quarter century, they went from that to, okay, let's build a stadium, uh, Dante Culpepper, let's run the group of five under a couple different head coaches, to now getting a power five invite. I mean, there are teams that have worked for decades and decades and decades to get a power five invite that have been left out. And UCF went from FCS to undefeated in the group of five to being having a seat at the table in the power five in – a little over two decades. There's so a I, reason why SMU got toasted by UCF. I mean, yeah. I, so I feel like this could be – they could still be on a rocket ship like mid-flight, and I want to I want to ride on the shuttle. So I'm, I'm buying UCF. I, I think some people are like, oh, directional school and commuter school, and why did we add them? They're not a geographic fit. I, I look at some other stuff and think they have a ton of potential. Yeah, and and they could be a flop too, you know. Maybe if they miss a couple coaching hires in a row, okay, they're fourth in their state. Um, they are isolated from the rest of the conference. Maybe that doesn't work out. Maybe they flop. But I, I'm willing to risk it, and I'm buying stock in UCF. Houston. Houston is interesting because they've had so much success recently in the AAC. Have they? Yeah. Have they had so much success in the AAC? Well, you're not going to win 10 games in the Big 12. No, I'm not asking about the – I'm asking – you said they've had so much success in the AAC. And I'm yes, Houston's you, been a very good program, yes. Is that true? Well, now you're going to maybe go look it up. Houston – They won the, the Peach Bowl against Florida State with Tom Herman. After yeah. that, I don't – I wouldn't – I don't remember much that makes me think they've – done so well for themselves in the AAC. When two of their conference mates, UCF went undefeated, uh, Cincinnati went undefeated in the regular season, made the playoff. Well, they went to uh, four and eight in 2019, Dana Holgerson's first year. 
I didn't realize that. Oh, and I forgot about Major Applewhite. Dang, Major Applewhite went seven and five and eight and five and got fired. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I just completely forgot about Major Applewhite in the when Major like, Applewhite era. They went, they went 12 and two last year. Okay. They played three semi legit opponents and went one and two against them. All right. But, but here's this here's what I was getting at. All right. Since 2013, eight wins, eight wins, 13 wins, nine wins, seven wins, eight wins. And then kind of the Dana Holgerson dip to get over the major Apple White era, uh, four wins, three wins in eight games, and then 12 and two last year. I think I was trying to sell. I'm going to sell Houston um, because I don't think they'll come in and have a bunch of eight win seasons when they jump into the big 12. Um, do I think they'll do a lot of things that UCF is going to do and put money into the program? Yes. They already pay like a power five program. Um, so I don't think their jump is as big as what UCF and Cincinnati are doing. Um, I think in a lot of ways, it'll be good for Houston to be in the big 12 maybe win a few more recruiting battles, uh, do a few more things, be able to spend even more money. Uh, but Dana's already a top half paid coach in the Big 12. Makes more money than Joey McGuire. What kind of uh, ROI Kelvin are they Sampson, getting on that investment? Kelvin Sampson is already a top paid Big 12 coach. So okay, Let's keep it to football, though. Well, I know, but just as an athletics department, I, I'm saying they're already spending that. So they don't get that bump that other schools do is all I'm saying. Okay. I'm, um, I'm selling as well. Already doing it, I'm selling Houston. I'm selling because nobody cares about Houston, even in Houston. Their attendance numbers are actually embarrassing. If you go look yeah. them up, uh, they're fourth out of four easily in terms of the newcomers. Yes. Or, or maybe I'm holding because I, I don't assess their stock value to be as high as you do. Um, I think they'll be bottom half of the new conference. When they get here, I think they'll stay there. So sell or hold, however you want to frame that. Sell. So. Sell. So. Um, BYU, I would I assess their stock value to be pretty solid right now. I, I'm probably in between holding and buying. I think that they're going to be one of those teams that is legit top quartile of the new Big 12 consistently. Uh, it's, it's just really kind of a matter of where do you perceive their value coming in. I think they'll almost just about start there. They're going to have the largest stadium in the new Big 12. They might have the biggest national brand in the new Big 12. And they've had some pretty good on-field success, not not anything earth-shattering. They haven't uh, broken into the New Year's Six or anything. But I think they've got a, a strong foundation for their football program, and I could, I could see them coming in and being pretty competitive at the top immediately and even building off of that. So... I, I'm probably between hold and buy, depending on what the exact stock price is coming in. They've only had one losing season since becoming independent in 2011. Four nine in 2017. But hey. like you said, seven and six, seven and six with two bowl games. So that's two six and six seasons. Seven and five, six and six season. Barnett Howard and Williams is a law firm that was started by three Texas Tech grads, office in Fort Worth, but handled cases all across the state of Texas. I was uh, reminded of them as we were discussing all these Big 12 teams in the state of Texas. Uh, Barnett Howard and Williams is one of the only law firms in the state that is certified for Title IX student representation. They defended students, including scholarship athletes, in Title IX litigation at all of the major universities in Texas. They also handle catastrophic injury cases if a fight breaks out at training camp or something like that. And for listeners in the Fort Worth area, they handle criminal defense and family law matters. They hope you never need them, of course, but they are here for you if you do. You can learn more about Barnett, Howard, and Williams by visiting their website, bhwlawfirm.com. I realized, Rob, that we were kind of doing multiple segments there without an ad read, so I just cut right to the chase. Yeah, the, that was not one of your better segues. Hey! No, no, <laughs> By the way, Barnett, Howard, and Williams. Um, uh, yeah, I think I, I think buying, I think by buying BYU, they're they're going to be able to um, continue doing what they want to do and have more opportunity to do the rest. And I think 
a head a head coach like um, what's their coach name? Satake or whatever. Yeah, I think I think he's there to stay, and I, I don't think he'll be bought out. Like Holgerson seems like a good fit. Malzahn, uh, back in the power structure, I think is a good fit at UCF. I don't think he'll be bought out by anybody else. Uh, the next school, though, Cincinnati, I I would sell Cincinnati pretty hard. One more note on BYU, and then we will get to Cincinnati. Would you agree that BYU probably has one of, if not the highest floors in the new Big 12? Yes. Yeah. I think so, too. That, that's where I think buying is a good – it, it's hard for me to see them getting to a place where, like, okay, losing season after losing season. Maybe that's a one-off as they rebuild, but I think they'll be a consistently winning program in the new Big but 12. I think they're recruiting – does well. They'll have to learn. I mean, it's been a decade plus since they've been in a conference, mm-hmm. um, and even longer. I guess they've never been in a great conference. They've the the whack for many many years. They're in the Skyline Conference. Um, they're in the Mountain West. They're in the two thousands with TCU, um, kind of running the conference with TCU. They're in the the second half of the two thousands, but I, I don't know. I. BYU is a school, and you talk about their national brand. I think they're just baked in, but they're going to have to learn how to play Big Twelve schools week in and week out because it's not it's not like playing an independent schedule. Although, I mean, last season they went five and zero against the Pac twelve. Certainly, um, a little bit further back, they won. They went two and zero in a home and home series against Texas. Now, granted, those were in kind of down years for Texas, but they're not your typical group of five in that like Cincinnati and UCF are basically trying their hardest to get two power five games on the schedule every year. BYU is already playing probably half their schedule roughly is power five. Um, So it'll still be an adjustment, but that's another good point. They probably have a little bit easier of a transition than Houston who plays like tech and maybe one other power five every year and then 10 AAC games. Agreed. Um, Cincinnati, you're selling. I probably would too. Um, it's just it. You can't go up after going undefeated and making the college football playoff as a group of five. So kind of nowhere to go but down. Yeah, not only will Cincinnati be sold in the next five years, I'm selling them immediately. Okay. I don't think they'll be good in 2022. Love Luke Fickle. Love him. He's getting paid like a Power Five head coach. He makes more money than Joey McGuire. Um, Cincinnati, I think fan base, athletic department. I like all that, uh, talent, rich state of Ohio. I think if some Ohio kids want to get out of the big 10, they can come into the big 12. I think they'll also have an opportunity to get a bunch of Texas kids. Um, but as, as good as they are in position. And I think maybe all the things you said about West Virginia can be true about Cincinnati. I don't see Luke Fickle being there long term. And I think they're great because of Luke Fickle and Desmond Ritter. And only half of them are back this year. They also had like 12 guys drafted last year. Yeah. And that means they're not at Cincinnati anymore. And I I just don't think a program like Cincinnati can immediately reload like that. I will say they've had going back 10, 15 years. They've had multiple coaches find success there. Um, yes. Going back to Brian Kelly, you know, like you don't make the jump to Notre Dame unless you're successful at a program like Cincinnati. And then it was a Butch Davis was hired at Tennessee from Cincinnati. Tuberville was a flop. I think he had like one, maybe two eight-win seasons there. And they got run out of town. And then Luke Fickle um, has taken them to pretty much their ceiling right now in the group of five. I, so I think that that's a program with 100%. a lot of – I think they've got a lot of inherent natural advantages. Like you said, the geography, you could do half your recruiting class in state every year and, and do just fine. Um, also a program, I think, that could take a lot of Big Ten transfer portal. You go off to Michigan, Ohio State, don't quite make the depth chart. You land on your feet at Cincinnati and do just fine for yourself. But with where their stock is at today – it's hard. It's impossible to buy. I think I'd probably be in between like hold and sell. I might hold half my stock and sell the other half and, and buy it once it kind of after Luke fickle leaves and maybe they have 
couple of rebuilding seasons, I'd probably buy back in at that point. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, just kind of like based on where they're at right now, it's it, it's hard to buy. I, I would certainly sell the first five years of Cincinnati, but the second five years, I would probably be back in. I agree. The other thing too is if you buy too many programs, you might be short on cash. You've got to sell some position, have some cash on hand, or if you need cash on hand, you can just go visit our friends over at Diversified Lenders who through a unique combination of accounts receivable financing and equipment leasing, they're uniquely qualified to help you get the working capital you need now so that you can buy stock in more Big 12 programs. You can check them out at diversifiedlenders.com. Red Raider uh, football letterman owned and operated, Cole Roberts and his dad, Don Roberts. Good local business. Supporters of the Gauchos, they're in for football season as well. Let's get to the last one, Rob. Texas Tech, our beloved flagship of West Texas. You just hired the greatest coach in school history. You've got $200 million coming online in facilities that will give you the largest contiguous football facility in the entire world. Yep. You've got an NIL collective that is, at least right now, on the cutting edge. Yep. You're about to string together the two best classes you've had in the last eight or nine years. One of those might be your best class ever, depending on how it finishes. And you're coming off your worst decade ever. So sort of the opposite of Cincinnati. Like they can't get much higher. Baylor, Oklahoma State can't get much higher. Texas Tech, if you look at conference win percentage, I'll have to double check this. I know this was accurate during the Wells era. Conference win percentage, they have not gone through an entire decade with the lower conference win percentage than they did in the 2010s. Even having said that, I think they've demonstrated their floor is a little bit higher than some other programs because even in the midst of that awful decade, you won the 2013 Holiday Bowl. You reached two other bowl games, which you lost the Texas Bowl and the Birmingham Bowl. And then this past season, of course, won the Liberty Bowl. Have never fallen to the point where you're at Kansas or Kansas State, pre-Snyder, anything like that. And I think the fan base is energized and they're ready to come back. So I look at all these factors and I've asked this maybe in the Discord or maybe on Twitter, what is missing? Unless McGuire is a flop, and I guess it's possible, but I really don't see that happening. What is Texas Tech going to be missing that they'll need to compete at the top of the new Big 12? What piece of the puzzle is not there? Um, talent, which, again, you're recruiting at a higher level than you have been. Um, c- consistency. I think you need to do that a bunch of times in a row and not just have one good class. By the way, 12 to 21, that's the decade, right? Worst decade, you're saying, in school history? Um, three, and I, two. I, three and two in bowl games. Yeah, it actually probably go back to 2011 because that was the first year you missed a bowl. That was Tuberville's second year. Probably go 2011 through 2020 was your worst decade ever. Okay. Probably. Still, if you count last year. Yeah. You're right, though. Yeah, because 2012. Uh, the Mighty Park Bowl, Bowl, yeah, with Chris Thompson. Want to know. Not bad for your worst decade ever. And I know there's a million bowls, and that doesn't mean the same thing it did in the 80s, but still. I think if you're saying just in stark contrast, will this team be different from the past five years to the next five years? I would say TCU, even though they've not been very good in the last five years, will probably go down. Uh, Iowa State, down. Kansas State, up. West Virginia, you're saying up. I think one of the more obvious ones, though, is Texas Tech, that they are straight up. And I mean, any kind of angle. You're a believer in the do theory. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're due for a good coaching hire, right? No, certainly. We're due for some luck to break our way with injuries, officiating, recruiting battles, something like that, right? I'm also a big believer in the hot hand fallacy. Okay. 
just the same thing as the new theory pretty much. Yeah. I'm I'm buying all the stock I can. Um absolutely. And it it's frustrating to see people who cover the sport um I think do it very poorly by just being so dismissive and say, Oh well, Texas Tech is its worst decade in program history and it always will be, and not think any more critically about it than that. But I'm not a very patient person, Rob. That's a weakness of mine. But we will get the last laugh. I don't know if it'll be in three years, five years, or ten years. Maybe Twitter will still be around then, and some receipts will have been kept, and we'll get to dance on the proverbial graves of some horrible takes. I'm buying all the stock I can in, uh, in Texas Tech. I'm hitting up diversified lenders getting as much cash for them as I can and using it all to buy stock in Texas Tech and Joey McGuire. And what's crazy is, I I mean, if we're talking about the new Big 12, that doesn't start this year, but next. So I think you're even getting a free year out of it. Yeah. Um, there was a fight at fall camp today, a little, a little scuffle. A little scuffle. Not a, not a lot of context. I don't think any coaches said, like, okay, here's exactly what was said and what was ha- and what happened. You get, I think you get the general – this happens all the time in NFL training camps. It's hot out there. These dudes are out there prancing all day. They get mad at each other. Sometimes they push and shove. Sometimes they throw punches. What's your reaction to there being a fight at fall camp? I am um... – all aboard fighting at fall camp. I hope the offensive linemen are throwing punches every day. I hope the defensive linemen are sucker punching the center. Um, uh, we talked about this earlier in a, I guess it was on the discord. Maybe if you want to join the discord, you can patreon.com. Um, and somebody said, I'm not going to say who it was, but somebody said, well, you know, uh, that could be uh a low discipline team that's fighting. No, I disagree. You need, you need aggression. That's something that's been missing. Cliff Kingsbury uh, said in press conferences for six straight years, they were looking for a killer instinct. Well, Cliff, it starts at the top and you're boring. Uh, you need some fire. So I think Joey McGuire, if you're going to be on like that 100% of the time, and by all accounts, he is, that's going to lead to some, some uh, high-level, intense boil over, and I think that's a good sign. And it's practice three. You want the team to be tired of hitting each other and ready to hit somebody else by the end of camp, and it's already happening? Yes, sign me up. I wish I could remember the movie. You might know it because you know every pop culture reference. It's a baseball movie. Yeah. And there's a benches clearing brawl. And some guys get in the mix and they're throwing haymakers. Other guys don't want to get suspended. So they stay on the bench. I guess it wasn't a benches clearing brawl because some guys stayed on the bench. Next day at practice, the manager uh, makes the guys who got in the fight run laps for getting into a fight. And then he makes the guys who stayed on the bench run laps for not being there to defend their teammates. And so do I want to see a fight at fall camp? No. Do I want that to spill over into the regular season and that be an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty and an ejection? No. But here's the thing. You can't surgically implant some dog into a guy. It's either there or it's not. Yeah. I would rather it be there and it need to be harnessed than it not be there at all. And it was not there at all in the last decade. Now, I don't want to see guys taking off their helmets and swinging them at each other. That's too far. But if one guy thought to give it a little more effort and uh, it felt good to him to move another man out of his way and he moved him too far onto the sideline after the whistle, good. And if it pissed off the guy that got moved out of the way too far off onto the sideline, and he didn't like some trash being talked to him, and so he said something back or did something about it, good. I'm all for it. As long as nobody got hurt and everything, I'm with you. 
We yeah, need some dogs like the, on the team. Absolutely. I like the coach's reaction, too. Yeah. It was uh, shared on Twitter. That's one of those, were you ever punished as a kid, and then 10 years later you found out your parents weren't actually mad at you? Yeah. I think it was that. I don't, I don't think Joey was, like, acting at all. But you see that clip when he's like, no, what are y'all doing? No, get back to the huddle. And I think after practice, I bet he went into the coach's office and was like, hell yeah. These yeah. guys want to scrap, let them. That's good. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I played a different level, of course, but in high school, I played with coaches that were like begging players, you know, go hit somebody. Yeah. Do you have anything in you that do you have any fire in your gut that you want to go hit somebody and knock their head off? And some kids, it's just not there. And usually at the power five level, it is. I'm, I'm talking like JV football here in high school. Again, you would rather it be there and you'd have to say, whoa, 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 and rate it in a little bit than having to beg your guys to show a little fire. An example that this is probably the third time I'm bringing this up on the Gambling Gouges podcast, but I, I just I cannot get it out of my head, and you'll probably know exactly where I'm going with it. TCU last year kicked your ass. And late in the game, when the ass kicking was pretty much complete, you know, it didn't matter what happened there. The score was settled. Uh, one of their guys, Sax Henry Columbia, which should piss off the offensive line in and of itself. And then kind of like drives his knee into him after the play. And, and everybody, you know, gestures at the like, hey, you know, where's the flag? Instead of doing anything about it. You know, how about you shove the guy who did that to your quarterback? But nobody wanted to do that because that culture wasn't there. That spirit wasn't there. It's there now. And I don't want dumb 15-yard penalties and consequential moments of the game. But uh, I was happy when I saw the fight. Again, I don't want anybody to leave with a broken jaw or anything. But I was like, cool, there's some dogs out there. That's good. Yeah, and it's certainly been missing it, it's especially through the Matt Wells era. You just and this is it's largely the same team, right? But I think there's something to be said about giving your team an atmosphere to be a little rough. Talk about uh, you asked Reggie Pearson about this kind of same overarching concept. Yeah, so you can see the clip on Twitter, but I asked Reggie Pearson what's the biggest difference between the culture at maybe Wisconsin and the culture in Lubbock. And really I was asking him about the city, right. About Madison versus Lubbock um, to see if there's any kind of culture shock. And he went into this. um, I thought really, really enlightening conversation about the culture. And he said, the culture at Wisconsin is tradition. And if you're a Texas tech fan and listen to the next two minutes of that clip, uh, which you can find, you know, on my Twitter at Rob Bro Show, and don't get mad about where your program is. Like, I don't know because it's really an indictment on the past four years at Texas Tech, um, and even probably further back that there's just an acceptance that you're going to lose to Texas and Oklahoma, or at least there was in the last three years. And there's just an acceptance that you're not going to beat people on your schedule. Um, And that's tough to hear. And I think Reggie was surprised when he got here that that was the case. Uh, But he also was firm in mentioning that that's not the case anymore. And that there's a thought that this team can compete with every team that's on the schedule, which is a breath of fresh air. And I also, I asked nearly every player at Media Day last year, you know, I go with uh, my day job, Talk 103.9. Uh, you can listen to me live weekdays on the radio land, except not this week. I won't be there. But it, it's, it's, it was a stark contrast because last year I said, hey, what, what are your goals for the team this year? And I remember guys, and I'll, I'll say their names, uh, uh, Colin Schooler and Rico Jeffers, and the guys that had been there said, oh, you know, uh, bowl game, six and six. We just – we want to be back competitive. And at the time, I did not like that. I thought it was funny because throughout the Cliff era, even when you thought there was no chance, the guys would say it's Big 12 championship or bust, man. And even though it's the Cliff era and you're not really being that successful, they had that fire, right, at least in August. But to be resigned to be six and six on day one. And so when I asked people that this year, even without the prompting of, hey, last year everyone said six and six, 
Uh, Jerron Bradley, like, waved his hand in my face, like, get that out of here. Get six and six out of here. Uh, Loic Fungi talks about winning a Big 12 title. Uh, Reggie Pearson was talking about being in the playoff picture. Um, Adrian Fry talking about winning the Big 12. Um, everyone I asked this year said Big 12 championship, not just a bowl game. And, and I think that belief – uh, goes to the thought process. And again, this is a lot of the same people last year. There's just a new confidence in the world in Lubbock. Yeah. And here's the thing about belief and expectations. If they go eight and four, most fans would consider that a really strong season compared to expectations. It's probably not going to be good enough to play for a Big 12 title. But within the four walls of the program, they'll say, okay. You know, people around town might be patting us on the back for a decent season, but we didn't meet our goal. Let's get our ass back in the weight room, back out on the field, and get better so we can achieve the goal next year. The problem with setting a goal of six and six is they went six and six last year, and were it not for a culture change, they would have gone, All right, great season, boys. We hit our goal. Expectations met. And now let's see what happens in the spring, whatever. And, you know, maybe we'll just trot out there with the same goal again next year. And it just kind of becomes that mediocrity becomes embedded in the culture instead of constantly striving to, okay, we might have had a good season, but the expectation was that we're going to have a championship season. So we better get it done again next year. When you alluded to it, the national media members, and I think of Joel Klatt, who saw Texas Tech at 5-3, oh. and three, right, and said that's where they should be. That is their expectation. They're meeting expectation at 5-3. and three. Know your place. Yeah, and, and I just – I don't think Joey McGuire knows his place. I'm glad he doesn't. And I said that, that when the yeah. flat tweet went out. I said, I'm glad that internal expectations are higher than outside expectations. Because if everybody internally was satisfied to, well, as long as Joel Klatt thinks we're doing the right thing. And, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. We're just little old Texas Tech, make a bowl game here and there. That, that's good enough. That's all we are. Who cares we didn't score in the second half against Kansas State and our offensive tackle gave up on a play and we got a safety in the red zone? Who cares? You think Oklahoma State, you think Mike Gunny in Oklahoma State ever said to themselves, hey, it's Oklahoma State, we bowl game, you win Bedlam once every five years? No, they said, we're going to go win BCS bowl games, New Year's Six bowl games, and they have. So that's my mindset on it. And hopefully we shock some people like, oh, wow, I didn't think this could happen at Texas Tech. I think it can. I think accepting six and six is a loser mentality that, keeps you at six and six forever. Yep. And I'm glad that the people in charge didn't want to accept it. And I think Joey McGuire and his team are the right guys to actually get you there and not just dream a little bit bigger. Did you um, see Matt Rule today? Future Texas Tech defensive analyst Matt Rule. That dude is going to get – did you see his press conference last week when he said, uh, it's not my job to pick the starting quarterback. That's the player's job. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I get what he was going for, that like they'll determine it on the field, but yes, you're the head coach. Personnel decisions are your Yeah, no, it's, job. in fact, is your job, yeah. Yeah. Um, Funny. And then you, today, today you made everyone run because they were having fun after a touchdown. Again, it's one of those, like in the baseball movie, you run if you get in the fight, you run if you stay yeah. on the bench. I remember times, you know, hey, quit being a jackass, quit being a showboat. But then other times, like, you know, you throw a touchdown in practice, and I was like, hey, go celebrate. We just did what we were supposed to do. Yeah. So I don't I don't ever understand that culture of, like, don't celebrate your successes. Um, you're going – you alluded to this. You're an employee of KCAM here in Lubbock, and you're not on the radio this week, but you're going to be out at practice with uh, during the media availabilities. I hope you're able to report back to us, but what kinds of stuff do you have your eyes out for this week at practice? Yeah, um, it'll be interesting. I, I don't know if I have any – because, look, we're out there for, what, 30 minutes, and it's really depending on what they're doing. Are they doing one-on-ones? Are they going to do some team drills? Do I get to watch the quarterbacks play? Um, is it going to be a scale? Is it going to be seven-on-seven? Seven? Um, but I do think in the next week they're going to have to make a lot of decisions – on the quarterbacks because that's leading up to the first scrimmage. And both Joey and Zach Kitley said after the second scrimmage, they want to be able to name a starting quarterback. Um, 
and that'll be around August 20th. So yeah, I expect to see maybe some separation. And I, I again, I want to see some aggression. I want to see the offensive line playing like Stephen Hamby. Yeah, exactly. I think we've missed that quite a bit. What's funny is you didn't have a single good offensive line coach on campus last year, and you have two now. And Hamby and Cock. All right. Oh, c- come on, Cock. I think it, like, people keep trying to be nice around me. They sucked. Last year's staff was bad. San Sunny Cumbie. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. That, so Cumbie, that, that, that's the only caveat. Okay. I'll say uh, I think DeAndre Smith and Joel Filani. Joel Filani was great. DeAndre Smith was great. Staff Keith, as a whole together, not good. Keith Patterson is a great person. He, I actually like Keith Patterson. I love Keith. And Patterson. I think I think the group got better uh, toward the end of October, just for no reason. I, but the offensive line has been bad for three years, and the same guy was in control. So don't give me the, oh, well, I don't know. if No, he was bad. And I think Hamby's much better. I think Cochran – who's the tight ends coach, is a D1 player in his own right, played at Texas, uh, would have gone to the NFL if his shoulder hadn't been messed up. So, I'm with you. I The results are unacceptable. These guys are in a public profession where they're paid a lot of money to deliver a result. I'm not going to go out of my way to, like, name call or whatever. But, yeah, when a guy's making, like, I don't know, 700000 to yeah. coach a position group and that position group isn't good, I think that's worthy of criticism. And, and people again, are always like – how would I you like it if be... I showed up at your job at McDonald's and yell, it's like, okay, the McDonald's cashier isn't making 700,000 a year yeah. in a public job to like, to deliver a result. So it's kind of a different expectation. there. Also, I'm in a public job. I don't make $700,000. I don't make, well, I'm not going to say what I make, but <laughs> it's a very low number and I get hammered when I have bad takes or whatever. So why can't they? People asking for heart attacks in my DMs. Jeez. Um. All right. Yeah, we can leave that. <laughs> leave it there. Um. A couple of things. I've wild I've, DM, man. I've alluded to this a couple of times. Uh huh. The pro West Texas energy over the last month, six months, off yeah. the charts. It's off the charts. And like vengeance came out, and everybody's like, "Sweet, Texas Tech gets mentioned there." We threw a watch party for vengeance. It sold out. We asked them for a bigger theater. They said, yes, it sold out. Uh, cool movie. We're not going to offer any spoilers or anything. I appreciate everybody who came out to that. And Did then, like 80- uh, yeah, I liked it. Wouldn't say I loved it. Yeah. I think I need to rewatch it to understand a couple pieces a little I, bit better. I, I want to watch it. I almost want to watch it again. Just like, I'll wait until it comes out. But I'm not spoiling anything, but there were some segments of the movie with extended dialogue. And I think you just have to listen closely to like tie some of those pieces together. Yeah. Um, It's it, the message of the movie might not be like extremely apparent on the surface. And then eight Oh six day. Yeah. Um, Of course we're doing countdown to kickoff. And I discovered at the time that August 6th was Joey McGuire's birthday on his Wikipedia page. Didn't think anything of it until I started seeing, uh, you know, I forgot what it was. There's like a, 725 day because Kansas State has yeah only lost to uh, Iowa State seven out of the last 25 games or something like that. And then people gave uh Matt Campbell a hard time seven and five day on July 5th. I was like 806 day. Let's you know just celebrate West Texas. And then I was like, that's Joey McGuire's birthday. Texas Tech's head coach, Texas Tech is an area code 806, was born of all days of the year on August 6th. And uh I Maybe I was oblivious before, but yesterday on social media, the 806 day stuff is out there. And like everybody's like, yeah, West Texas 806. And I just haven't seen that. I felt like my whole, the whole time I've lived here, which is a decade now, I've had to like defend it and be like, hey, it's not that bad. Lubbock's actually a cool city. It's got some stuff going for it. And now everybody is just like, they love West Texas. And like the tide has turned. I think it's partly because of the basketball program success. I think it's Joey. And they have the West Texas tough and the cactus and all that, but it's cool to see the people out here finally embrace it and love it. And even people who don't live here, like, Hey, you know, I'm in Dallas now, but Dallas is West Texas. And 
they go to Turks and Caicos on vacation. They're like, Turks and Caicos is West Texas. Like everybody's just colonizing everywhere and it's all West Texas. And I love to see it. You know, for the last probably five years on social media, I have been pretty adamant that Lubbock is awesome. And I get hammered quite a bit, right? And what was it? Um, probably this, maybe in um, this year, early this year, it was Lubbock's not boring, you are. That was the, the big thing for a while. Yeah. Um, but you and I have gone out of our way to be pro-West Texas and pro-Texas Tech. We love when, you know, recruiting battles are won, uh, when Amarillo players stay home, when – Odessa, Midland, um, even the smaller towns post coming up, stay home. The the LISD schools staying home. Um, we've been very pro West Texas. And it's just maybe affirming that everyone else is now getting in the battle because even people in Lubbock for so long hate Lubbock. Yeah. It's and sad, I just don't understand that. Like, if you don't want to be here, like an old Spike Dykes line, you know, if we don't want guys that don't want to be here. So. Yeah. And, you know, hey, I don't begrudge anybody for choosing to live somewhere else. My entire adult life, I've chosen to live here. But it, it's cool. Like, even the people that moved to um, Dallas, which, you know, which is not a similar city in size or anything, or even to the other side of the country or something, they seem like they want to get back more often than they used to like i think it used to be like oh i'm gonna leave lubbock and don't really have any desire to go back now it's like you know i live in north carolina or wherever and i want to make sure i make it back once a year to see a football game or basketball game so anyway i I think i think a lot of it honestly is the football coach and embracing pump jacks cacti even though it's not a lot of cacti in west texas but embracing the symbolism of the cactus um and again just going back like cliff I think he, I think he liked it here. Uh, he obviously loves Texas Tech and is an alumnus. I don't yeah. think he bought into West Texas culture. I don't think he sold that very well. I don't think Matt Wells did either. Um, it's why they tried to have the spring game in Dallas. Well, we got a lot of alumni that live in the big city. True, but you're the flagship of West Texas, and you need to sow here because there's people like me and you that want to go watch the spring game, and we don't want to drive five hours east to do it. And I think Joey has the opposite. I think he loves it here, sees why this place is unique and can genuinely sell people on it. I don't mean sell people like convince them. I mean, he can earnestly portray why he likes it here, why this is a great university, why these kids would flourish in this community while they're here and afterwards. And so it, it, it's cool to see stuff like 806 Day, which is made up. Everybody's tweeting about it and just tons of pro West Texas energy, and I'm here for all of it. Imagine if we win, dude. If we start winning 10 games, what the West Texas energy is going to be like. We'll be insufferable. <laughs> Probably already are. Probably already are, but if you ask someone, um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, he kind of only singled out you on that. On the oh, yeah, I saw, him at, uh, I saw him at media day, and he was like, hey, man, stirring up any trouble? No, talk about Don. And that's why, you know, Rob, obviously you and I have a ton of fun just talking Texas Tech, but also wanted to turn this into a little bit of a side hustle, earn a little bit of money while we're doing it. And thankfully, I think we recorded our first episode about one year ago. Um, Have been fortunate enough to build a following with the greatest fan base in the world on Twitter and a listener base that has turned this into a platform that we're able to promote local businesses. Y'all know our sponsors. We love them. Hope that you patronize their business. The last one we'll give a shout out to this episode, Code Ninjas. Y'all have heard about their summer camps. Those are kind of winding down, but the fun never stops at Code Ninjas, okay? As you know, they teach kids ages 5 to 14 how to level up their coding, STEM, and engineering skills in a fun, hands-on environment through their year-round coding programs. Offering flexible afternoon and weekend hours, kids visit their center each week to learn coding, logic, and problem-solving skills while creating video games and meeting new friends. They start out as a white belt, and kind of like karate, they move through nine different belt levels all the way to black belt. 
where they will design and create their very own app or game, similar to the Gambling Gauchos video game that debuted earlier this summer. Coding will be one of the most valuable skills for today's kids to thrive in the future. So schedule a tour and a free first session at CodeNinjas.com. Whether you went to a summer camp and enjoyed it and want to keep going, or if you missed a chance this summer, they've got stuff during the school year as well. I know kids are doing band, soccer, Girl Scouts. This is another great arrow in the quiver to keep kids busy, keep them learning valuable skills that will help them for many years to come. Pretty awesome. It's good stuff. Um, a couple teasers. The Vengeance Watch Party went pretty well. Keep an eye out for more related to that. And get in early. We did have to turn people away last time. Last time as in implying that there might be an upcoming next time. Um, Patreon.com slash Gambling Gauchos, $5 a month. We just recorded an interview with Jason Shear, who is the only sane person west of the central time zone covering the Pac-12 and realignment. He had some great thoughts kind of from Arizona's perspective and what he thinks is going to happen next. A portion of all proceeds go to the Matador Club and you get access to our Discord server, which is hopping with... Man, Rob, that was... It was one channel when we created it, a general channel. Now we've got a food and beverage channel, movies and entertainment channel, Stone Cold Locks channel, memes, everything. Uh, we'll start bench cut anything in the Discord. It's a good time. So we hope you will join us on Patreon and on Discord. It's $5 a month. Patreon.com slash gambling gauchos. And at Cardinals, you can get an It's All West Texas t-shirt, which... I think, Rob, have gotten great reviews. So awesome job on the design there. I think people are proud to wear those around, especially obviously in West Texas, but the people who like live out of state and are going to get asked to like, hey, what is that shirt? Oh, well, like even though we live in Georgia, it's all West yeah. Texas. So that's good stuff. There, uh, uh, what was it? Out of the country, huh? It's in all the West Texas. Was it like at Stonehenge or something? Hey. Who tweeted that out? Rome? I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> you didn't see that one? I uh, know. I love people flooding our DMs with wherever they are being West Texas. Um, last thing, we I kind of uh, just found myself in an impromptu spaces on Twitter over the weekend. One of those times, Rob, I think it was like 1 a.m. And I was like, cool, I'll go talk college football with some randos. Yeah, um, I, I noticed you were in there at like. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows what I was doing? I was watching um, the OCR. I would have gotten in. Yeah, uh, we're going to be doing another one. We'll do a Gaucho's After Dark iteration with our friend Baylor Bearhead. Uh, he's got some great insight. He's um, He's got a good grasp on uh, a lot of statistical components that I think some other people who cover the sport don't. He's very high on Baylor, and I think probably with good reason, but I'm curious to kind of dig into that a little bit more. And he wants to learn more about Texas Tech, so you and I will be chopping it up with him. Maybe another Baylor Media personality. Uh, that'll be Wednesday night at 9 o'clock on Twitter. So hope you'll join us for that. Should be a good conversation. I won't be there. Cool. Well, I will be talking to <laughs> Baylor Bearhead. <laughs> well, maybe I will be. I don't know. I don't know my plans yet this week. Okay. I'm trying to get out to uh, explore some West Texas, and I don't know if that'll be um, when that'll be. Okay. It's no pressure. I can. You did the Jason Shear episode without me, I so I can I can cover for you if need be. Paladuro is West Texas. Yes, um, I get it that people don't aren't in on the bit, and like when they question if Fort Worth is West Texas, I was a little bit surprised that people were telling me the eight hundred six area code was not West Texas the other day. Yeah, a bunch of Panhandle truth. The pan, that's like saying Odessa isn't West Texas; it's in the Permian Basin. Like those are all subregions of West Texas. Yeah. Concho Valley, the big country, far west Texas, the Panhandle, Cap Rock, that's all, it's all west, west Texas. Texas. The Florida Keys, that's west Texas. Las Vegas Strip, that's west Texas. Uh, that's all I got, man. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to everybody who follows us on Twitter and Instagram at Gambling Gauchos. Man, I'm pumped football season is here. So close. 26 days when people listen to this, and we'll keep that countdown going, and it'll be here before you know it. Be in Rio Dosa, making week zero picks before you know it.
Rob, do you uh do you love the people? I love the people. Love y'all. All right, love y'all.